On comb honey, one of the most important things that you gotta have is a good honey flow. If it's a honey flow that's just dribbling in real slow, it's hard to get the bees to draw the comb out and uh, put the honey in. You need a really good honey flow. That's utmost importance. So it's kinda important you get your boxes on early. Um, one of the things that I think that there's two or three things that you can do if you want a good quality comb honey. One of those things is you gotta of course have a really good strong hive of bees. And if any of you were over my two queen class over there talking about running two queen hives to build the hive up with a uh, queen at the bottom and a double screen and a queen up on top where you got 16, 18 frames of brood at the beginning of the honey flow, that's a good way to do it. Uh, using swarms to make comb honey is an ab absolutely fantastic way to do it because they're primed to draw comb. They, they fill their honey gut, their guts full of honey to draw a comb when they go out and they think they're gonna be in a tree, so if you catch them somewhere, they're, they're gonna draw a comb really good. Uh, Caucasian bees tend to glue everything up, but make some of the most beautiful white cappings that you'll find. So the breed of the bee can do a little bit uh, on the comb honey cappings, you can see that. What type of bee was that? Caucasian. Well, they're, they use a lot of propolis, and Bob Benny's talking about how propolis is a nature's antibiotic, how that's also, they're thinking it's good for the bee's health, but they do glue everything together, and you can break parts trying to get it apart. Um, back a few years ago, uh, I was judging American Honey Show, and or I, I, maybe I was a contestant then, I can't remember anyway, I, I judge now, but Gene Killian was judging a honey show. And just to show you the difference in bees, he said, a uh, person got a blue ribbon on this comb honey entry. It was four square boxes of comb honey. And he said, those four square boxes, said each one of those came from a different hive, didn't they? And Gene said, yeah. Or the guy on it, bees, the beekeeper said, yeah. And he said, how'd you know? Gene said, I can tell by looking at the cappings. So each one of them has a little bit different characteristic, but the Caucasians build beautiful white cappings. If you leave it on there too long, if you're making comb honey, they can travel stain it and then get propolis on it. So as you're making comb honey on the cap, you want to get it off. You'll make sure it's dry enough. If it's not dry enough, dry it. But anyway, you gotta have a really good hive of bees. So you can use a double queen hive. Uh, you could combine two hives. You could shake a hive down into a medium box and not leave her a lot of room to lay in a queen excluder and a box on top. Um, if I had one of those years that we don't seem to have anymore of a lot of clover honey, I would take and put a box on when they got that box, you know, full, I'd put that comb honey super on and another box above it. But that takes a really good honey flow to fill all that up and we don't seem to have those flows anymore. Uh, one of the problems that I got into, or I, I try to run singles to make comb honey and that's what I was gonna get to. That singles, you know, they, they're more enticed to make comb because you've got them more crowded. So you gotta watch swarming but I kept getting pollen in my comb honey super, in my comb. And that creates two problems. Number one, wax balls. If they get an egg in there, they'll give you, if you don't have it in a jar real quick and covered with honey, then they messed it up. Hive beetles, you know, they love pollen. So the easy way to use and make comb honey and not get pollen in your comb honey Anybody got any ideas besides, a, and it's not a queen excluder, what would you put on a hive to keep the queen down in the bottom and not get pollen in your comb honey system? Pollen traps? Uh-uh, well, it's close. You use the same screen wire that the queen goes through with a pollen trap as a queen excluder. You get, the, I, I can't, what's the mesh? Uh, I think it's a six. You could Google it, but if you put that on as your queen excluder, it will act as a pollen excluder. And that will keep that pollen out of your honey supers. One of the problems that I have in Kentucky, especially on clover honey, clover honey has a high pollen content. They make a lot of pollen off of it. So you're gonna get more up in that comb honey if you don't have a way to keep it out. Now the farther up you're away from the brood nest, the less amount of pollen you're gonna have in it, but to get them to draw it out up there is another story.
there's your problem. And if you're making your comb honey early, say you're making it off your black locust and uh, bush honeysuckle, locust has very, 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 very muscule amount of pollen. Uh, very little amount of pollen. You're lucky to find one grain of locust pollen in a sample. So if you're making comb honey from locusts, you're not going to get a lot of pollen in your comb honey super, because at least from the locusts. And if you're on poplar, you can get a lot, because poplar is a big, big pollen source and nectar source. But using the mesh wire will knock that pollen off and act as a queen excluder and a pollen excluder. You missed that. You're late. I know her, I'm picking on her. Is that why black locust honey is sometimes more clear? That's not, uh, it's just the color of the nectar. Is yeah, wood's the same way. Sarawood doesn't have much pollen in it. Very little pollen in wood honey. You're lucky to find one grain of wood pollen in a sample. Or a clover's got a lot, you know. I know when I, I tried to run and make comb honey using a single brood box, and I kept getting pollen up in my supers, and I mean a lot of pollen sometimes. Well, then the consumer buys that, and that pollen's got a bitter taste to it. It's not the not best thing you put in your mouth, and they're not real happy, let alone the, the problems that you get with wax moths and other things if you don't get it cut real quick. So then I, you know, I got to there for a while running the two queen hives and had those big hives of bees. When we had a honey flow, I let them make a box of honey, then put my comb honey super on, and then put a drawn comb above it, but you better have a good honey flow. It's going to last a while to draw that out and fill it up. It's, you really need to crowd them. So I, you know, use a medium box or a single deep. Use a swarm. Uh, you you could take a two two story hive and shake them down in a single box and crowd them, and check for queen cells every week and make sure you don't leave any queen cells. Throw that screen that screen wall on there and crowd them, and you make beautiful comb honey. I don't try to make any lately because I haven't had a good honey flow and I hesitate to do it in Sarawood because I take the bees, I'm two to six hours from those locations and I don't have time to go back and check them and manipulate and, and you don't know what it's going to do. One year it'll make four or five boxes, next year you'll make uh, three pounds, I've done that too. And it can't, you can't look at it and tell what it's going to do, you don't know. Now, if you're like this lady up here with the red hair and runs all the blue ribbons at the honey shows, you want some really nice comb honey. <clears throat> so that means you want the midrib straight in it. And you and you don't want uh, you know the midrib running crooked or running like this and all this kind of thing. If you use when you put your wax in a frame to make comb honey and you've put a full sheet, it tends to want to bow. <clears throat> when it bows, what does it do? It makes your comb crooked. Well, they attach this one over here to this one over here. So <coughs> when I make comb honey and fix my comb honey supers up, I use either a real shallow strip of comb or I'll, get, I'll fold a sheet in half. I use a half a sheet and put it in the top of the frame and let them draw it all the way down. All I want is to start a strip at least an inch long and let them draw it. The downside is sometimes they'll make that bottom part drone comb where you didn't have a piece of foundation. But for selling it, that's okay. If you want to enter the honey show, it's not okay. So, but in order, I always usually use about one, one and a half inch strip, about a half a sheet, about halfway down. And I like to use a medium box for my comb honey because I can cut it long ways and get about 10 pieces out of a frame that doesn't float up very much in a one pound jar where a shallow frame, it floats up or you cut it the other way, it, it just don't work out as good. Or if you want to put it in a box, you know, it's not big enough. And I could get into showing honey here a little bit, but when you put comb honey in those four by four boxes, you don't want it that far from the edge. I learned that the hard way. First time I showed honey, I didn't get any award. You want it out to the edge. And a shallow frame is too small. So in which you if you're doing it, showing it and putting it in a jar. You don't. You want even any of it. You want to. You want that middle mid reel to be straight. If you're going to do it for show, and so therefore using, even if you use three quarters of a sheet of wax, just don't put the full sheet in. Goes top to bottom. And uh, you know, and if you are doing it for show, you don't want to bruise the capping. So when you judge comb honey, you judge the quality of it. You don't want any bruising where you've squeezed the cappings with your fingers. You handle it from the midrib. Um, 
And those are just some basic things on the quality of it. Uh, I haven't showed honey for 20 years, but the last time I showed Gene Killian, who I was talking about a minute ago, told me it's the best comb honey entry I've ever seen. He asked me how I'd done it. I said very carefully. Because it took me about nine hours to do four jars. So it's a tedious thing. But I think the most hardest thing that you do. Uh, when you put the honey in the uh, cone in the jar, do you have the honey already in there? No. Okay, you just put the cone in the Yeah. How I, did, how I did the comb honey, the entry that he said is the best entry he'd ever judged. And Gene Killian was probably the most foremost honey judge that's ever been in this country. Was uh, I had the jar laying. I will not tell you this, you're a cheat. <laughs> I had the jar laying down like this, and I had the comb honey on a, like a, a cake icing knife, and used both hands, and I went in about an inch a minute. So I didn't booger the edges, the edges were like a piece of paper, but they touched on all four corners of that glass, but they weren't boogering. That's what Gene told me, he said, how'd you get that comb in there and not booger that? I said, very carefully. But I don't have the patience, and I'm too old, I probably got a little, I don't shake, but I probably don't have that steady a hand I did. That's been 25 years ago when I've done that. But that's, you know, when, when you're doing comb honey, you just got to crowd the hive, and you got to have a really, really, really good honey flow. If you get the flow that it just kind of dribbles in, and you're making a, takes you two, three weeks to make a box of honey, you're going to struggle to make comb honey in that kind of honey flow. Very difficult. This is something a lot of people don't realize. When the bees have to draw the comb, they make half as much honey. So you gotta get more for your comb honey. If you don't, you're throwing money down the potty. And that's why comb, or good drawn comb is gold. It's hard to get people to understand that. It's hard to get people to understand what, you know, and, and, it, and, and you can't control swarming without drawn comb unless you're in there every six, seven days cutting queen cells out, or every, at least every 10 days. It's just hard to do because that's Mother Nature. you got to almost crowd them to get comb honey, and if you're crowding, they're going to want to swarm. And that's why I, I advocate if you want to make comb honey and you catch a nice big swarm of bees, bingo, there it is because she's already swarmed. She's primed to draw comb. And that's where you can, you know, and put her as tight a quarters as you can and let them draw that comb out. But, you know, again, you got to have the honey flow to do it with. And you got to have a good queen, but the the Caucasian bees make that nice, beautiful white comb. But if you don't get it off when they get through capping it, they'll propolis or you know put propolis stain on it. So you have to get it off quick if you don't break the frame getting it out, because <laughs> they do glue it together. Uh, but you know Bob Benny's saying I haven't talked to Bob about it much, but I was talking because our bees in Florida or in Georgia are. I want Sarah Wood are real close to each other. We're 20 miles apart. Um, he's using some Caucasian stock because he's, they're thinking that the, the propolis and its natural antibiotics are helping with the viruses and some of the bee health. He thinks the bees are healthier with that Caucasian gene in that breed of bee. And that makes sense because propolis is a natural antibiotic. So you know, like I said, I haven't made a lot lately, but that's, you know, it's, you got to crowd them and then you got to really control swarming. That's the biggie. So it comes down to, you know, basically small brood box, crowding them, using the mesh instead of a queen excluder if you want to try to keep the pollen out of it, but using a swarm. I used to, I had great success using those two queen colonies. Because I had 18, 16, 18 frames of brood and all those bees, so they would draw it on out. I didn't have to crowd the brood nest that much. And, and, and this is something that a lot of people don't realize. And I, there's just some hives that don't want to draw comb. They just don't want to. Why? Don't ask me. I don't know. But I remember one year, probably back in the 80, early 80s, I put these comb honey supers on. That's when I figured out that they only made half as much honey. Because this one over here made two boxes. And it had already made a box, and this one had already made a box, but it only made one box of comb honey. And it was consistent, but I had this one, I put a comb honey super on, I go back checking, yep, it's got swarm cells. I went three weeks, they did, I don't know what they did with the honey, but they never did draw out. That. They would not draw wax out. They just, maybe a frame or two. 
And I think it was just genetic of that bee. I put a drawn comb on them, boom, here they went making honey again. Can you That's, draw a comb in another hive and, and then move it in there, like make comb in the fall, and then uh, try to make you can, but trying to keep that comb clean where it don't get dust and dirt in it and all that is a problem. You know, it's tough to do that and it gets brittle and breaks and everything else. It's almost impossible to do. Even if you keep it in a hive, does it get brittle? It'll, they'll travel stain it and it'll get dirty. The only way you could really do it if they got it drawn out, and then of course if you try to sling the honey out of it, it's probably going to tear the comb out because it ain't got no water support. But if you had put it in a plastic bag or something and sealed it up tight and then put it back on, but it's you basically need to catch it at the, early in the season when that flow's starting because it's going to take some time. You know, you make a, a medium box of comb honey, that's equivalent to making 80 or 90 pounds of extracted honey. Because in a medium box, you make 40 pounds of comb honey, that's 80 pounds of extracted honey. I haven't had an 80 pound crop in Kentucky since 2000. Uh, 15. I made about 75 pounds in 2017. I used to always make 80 pounds of hive. Always. But the weather is not what the weather used to be here. You know, and, and the locusts this year, my area all froze, all the poplar froze. We had a 25 pound crop. I took bees to uh, Eastern Kentucky, over the hill, they had a 100 pound crop. I'm up here on the hill up high, you think, and I got poplar everywhere. No bloom froze. Didn't freeze down the valley this year. It always freeze in the valley. It froze up on top of the hill. Don't ask me. Maybe they were a little bit four days later blooming and they hadn't butted out yet. That's what I'm thinking. It's just the last few years have been bad, so I haven't made any comb honey. You got to have honey flow. Any questions? But I heard you say something about using a screen to keep the pollen out. What? I think it's six mesh. I can't remember. Eight mesh they don't go through. Be what they use in pollen yeah. yeah, exactly. It's the water they use. And what it does, it knocks the pollen off when they go through it, and it acts as a queen excluder because the queen can't get through. That's what I use on my comb honey supers. Uh, that's one of the issues with comb honey. There's two or three issues with it. One, you can store it in there where it's nice and dry. Typically, beetles do not bother comb of any kind if it don't have cocoon in it from brood or pollen. If it's pure honey, they don't bother it much. Wax moles don't bother it much. But you get pollen in that comb honey, you gotta get it cut and put in a jar if it's got a speck of pollen, or you may have a little wax moll starting in it. Now you can always cut that little spot out, but that's a problem. And same way with a high beetle can hatch out in it. So, you know, try to keep the pollen out of its best thing. And then if you do got it, just little specks here and there, it's going to hurt you when I judge a honey show. I'm going to dock points. But it's saleable. But if you get a lot of pollen in it and sell it to a consumer that's never had pollen and they don't know what it is and they put that in their mouth and eat that pollen, they might not want to buy the next jar either because it's bitter. Don't taste too good. And a lot of them don't know what it is. What, is that dirt in there? You know. Is that dirt in that? What, what, what's in there besides that honey? So, you know, that's, it's just good to try to keep it out. Questions? What, what about uh, uh, comb in a mason jar? Well, that's it's another reason. I, it in a mason jar. Oh, well, yeah, that's, that's a neat deal. You can do that. Put the jar up on top of a lid and let them fill that up. And they'll say, how do you get that comb in there? But then again, you're back really forced them to do something and creating more of a swarming scenario. It's kind of a novelty trick. It's, it's a novelty yeah. trick. It's, it's a novelty thing. Now, that's what I like about the medium boxes. But even though the one pound jars, when you go to a quart, that length of that comb fits pretty nice in a quart jar. You know, the way it fits in there much better than a shallow does. So that's why I went to, you know, of course, I got rid of all my shallow supers. In fact, I gave a bunch away last month, and I got a few more gifts to somebody wanted them. I don't use them anymore. I've got a question about the waxworm. You said that they can actually lay, and you can actually have waxworms in your honey after you've strained it? No, no, this would be in the comb honey, and you take that comb honey off the hive and set it in the room and don't get to cut it out for oh, three or four or five yeah. days. You could have a little waxworm hatch out if it had pollen. I've never seen a waxworm bother comb that was white comb, comb honey or extracted if it didn't have 
never had brood in it and never had pollen in it. Wax moths don't bother it. I don't even fumigate my comb when I store them. I had a friend that said he thought he put his in a freezer. I never heard of it. Oh yeah, you can put it in a freezer and freeze it and kill you know anything in it. No, normally I don't worry if it don't have any pollen or anything in it. Now, I don't, I've never had that problem. I reckon but if you've got pollen in you know, you get one of those years that prolific on pollen and maybe clover and you're making a lot of the honey out of the clover. You can, I've had quite a bit of pollen get stuck in my comb honey before. I mean, you know, whole sales of it, four, five, six, you know, thing bigger than my fingernail pollen. And it, then it looks bad. Oh, it, yeah, you know, because consumer don't know what it is. And I'm like, you always use the, the new comb. New comb. Yeah, well, you can. I, I've had brand new comb haven't put pollen in it. I don't, I don't, in some years, when there's a lot of pollen flow, it's like one. This is not on comb honey, but I told you to make sure it was dry enough. You know, make sure just because it's capped don't mean it's good. It can be. It can ferment. In a wet year, it can be high moisture. Oh, yeah. In 1982, I had two bo two supers of honey totally ferment that was totally capped. So this myth of, oh, if it's capped, it's fine, is not necessarily true. You need it down really about, under 18 is great, 17, 4, 17, 5 is much better. I had 18, 2% honey ferment one time. I had about, I don't know, 25, 30 gallons of the basement floor. It was 18, 2. It blew the lid off the bucket and turned the buckets over, and I went running down the steps with a gun in the middle of the night, thought somebody broke in the house. That's true. Was it partially crystallized or not? I don't, I don't remember, I don't, no, I don't think it was because it, 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 it and that's why I preach uh, how to dry hunting and, you know, use a dehumidifier and make sure it's dry enough before you bottle it. And why when I judge a honey show, I judge different than one of the other major people judge is if it's not 17.5, I dock points, anything that's above that. And that's why. I don't want to. I don't want to give somebody a blue ribbon, and they take it and give it to the governor, and he sets it on his table in the office, and he comes in Monday morning. And there's honey everywhere. He blow the lid off. That wouldn't be a good example of good honey. What makes some of the years the honey turns to sugar? One year more than it does. That's the floral source usually, and it can very. I found that in those really good clover years. Yeah that it granulated quicker than it did in the years that it was not hardly as good a year. It was a little bit darker. Now why, I don't know. Uh, locust honey, I've kept it six, seven years. It doesn't granulate. Now that the bush honeysuckle's coming, it will granulate. So I used to try to make my comb honey out of locust because it didn't granulate. That's one of the problems with comb honey is granulation. There ain't no way to liquefy it. You put it in a jar. Now you can, and I've done it, but it's a pain in the butt. Lay it on its side like this. I've got a refrigerator that I put honey in to liquefy it. The light bulb and at about a, and put it about 100 degrees and let it lay like that. And sometimes you can get it to liquefy and not mess the comb up. More, that's what the only, but you have, if you keep it up like this and that comb, it's going to... If you lay it down, but it takes you know a while to do it, and about 100 degrees, it'll eventually liquefy it and it won't ruin it. It won't look like it did you put it in there, but it won't totally ruin it. But if you can make your comb honey off poplar, it doesn't granulate. Locust doesn't granulate. Sarawood doesn't granulate. I don't, I've never made any gallberry honey, but that's where a lot of the comb honey you steal on shore shelves come from. Then in Georgia, because gallberry doesn't granulate. But lo and behold, you make it in the fall off aster and gold or not, it'll be granulated before you can sneeze. Of course, I ain't made no aster and gold or not. I always made four or five drums. I ain't made none for five years. Dry weather and bush hogs mowing it off. Well, you, you got to have some rain. Cold rain stops it. And this keeps it from getting started. I mean, when I'm burning up at home, I'm brown. But, you know, one of the big things, again, in comb honey is granulation. Now, you can freeze honey and keep it from granulating. It will not granulate frozen. And I guess you, I've never done it, but you could take that comb honey super out of a freezer, let it thaw out, and if you wanted to do, a, say, a Christmas festival and you knew it was going to granulate before that time and then put it in jars and sell it and it might be granulated. I got a question for you. How come these people say it's clover honey, it's cerebral honey, 
when you've got 30 to 60,000 beads in a hive, some of them's going to clover, some going to sarah, some going to locust. How can you say it's one over there? Yeah, locust is going to bloom here normally first week of May. I'm not going to have much clover in bloom. The clover is going to be water white, color of water, much like bush honeysuckle. Sure. Clover is going to be a little bit darker. Yeah. Um, that right there, I can taste it and tell you what it is. When I went down to, I put bees in Harlan County this year to make sarah wood because I knew we wouldn't get no clover. But I took them down, down there for poplar originally because mine was here was froze. Well, I got down there and of course poplar froze. Well, I made. Well, what do we make? 50 pounds of basswood. Basswood has a minty flavor to it, winter greeny minty flavor. And when you're extracting, it's the best smell in the world in the honey room. It smells awesome. Only time I ever made that. When I went down to take that off, Sarah Wood had started, but the basswood had just quit and I had frames that was mixed. I could look in the frame and they'll never mix two kinds of honey in the same, in the same cell. If they're working poplar and locust, one cell will be water white and one will be amber. And I could I pull frames out and look, and that, that real light honey taste it, Sarah would. Just a little bit shade darker, had that mini flavor. I knew what it was right there. Right. It would mix it. So I pulled I pulled all the the basswood off when, and the frames that had a little bit of Sarah wood in them and left that with the basswood. And I sold it, I didn't sell it, I just said it's basswood honey because it's mostly basswood. But the sarah wood I had was probably 90 some odd percent sarah wood because there's no clover up there blooming in the woods. And there's nothing else at that time for them much to work other than sumac. And sumac's a whole lot darker and I can pick it up in that comb that quick. We have a few trees here there. Probably between a poplar and a basswood. It's called a bamboo tree. I don't know about that one. Oh really? I never heard of that. Now poplar is gonna, it's gonna look amber. It's gonna have a reddish cast to it. And I like poplar enough that I traded a jar of, uh, uh, this year for. I gave a guy a jar of sarah wood for a jar of poplar. And the sarah wood's high dollar honey. It's seven dollars and a half, eight dollars a pound in the barrel. But I like poplar that much, and I didn't get to make any, so I wanted a jar to eat, so I traded him one. He got a pretty good deal on that, because poplar ain't worth what Sarah Wood is, but I wanted some poplar to eat. Um, but I can tell by tasting it. I pretty much know what the taste is, and that's like Bob Beanie can. People has been in the honey business for years, can taste of it and tell you, you're never going to get 100% clover or 100% Sarah Wood. They're going to they're gonna pick a little something up. And I get Sarah Wood some years that I can taste it. It's got a Sarah Wood flavor, but I know it's not high-quality Sarah Wood. It's Sarah wood, but it's, uh, you know, it's got other stuff in it. And I can tell when I taste it. Uh, but typically those blooms, you got to pull your honey at the end of every bloom. You can't let them sit on the box and pull once a year. You have to pull, be on top of it. Uh, I remember back eight, nine years ago, the beekeeper there at home I helped, he was 94 years old. And I stayed in Florida because... You know, everything here bloomed a month early. Locusts blooming a month early. That's going to freeze it. I come back and he couldn't lift the boxes off, so he just kept stacking them as they made honey. And he had it marked locusts. And when the locusts was blooming, it was color of water. And then he had the clover. He had one question mark where that was a mix. But the mistake I made, I come back, he says, well, can you come help me take my honey off? And he only had two hives left. He used to have 40, 50, but he got old and couldn't take care of them. And I guess they did, must have kicked, his, it was his last year he passed away that winter. I went down to help him take it off. He said, well, we'll just do one hive. I said, I, I can't, or we'll just do half of it. I can't extract it all. I thought, well, how much has he got, you know? I got down there, he had 10 shallow supers on both hives. Oh 5, 11, 16. Yeah. He had three locusts, three shallow supers of locusts and six clovers on both hives, full. And that was his last hurrah. Now well, that's pretty Pretty good going out present. Yeah, it's it's about the color of clover, give or take. Last year, I don't know why it was a little darker, but it had the real good sarah wood flavor. And I, I I'm not supposed to say who I sold two barrels to because they're a big, big sarah wood name, but they paid me 
almost ten thousand dollars for two drums of honey. They come and tasted of it, so I knew it was good sour whether they would have bought it. But it was a little darker than average. Usually, it would go in the white class. Rick. Any other questions, comb yeah. honey? Rick. Yes. This isn't comb honey. I'm sorry, but what's your take on? I'm seeing more and more. Uh, people using the term organic on their own. To be organic by USDA standards, you cannot have a garbage can within five miles. Yes. Yes. Because they can go to a garbage can to get a piece of Coke out of that garbage can, out of the Coke can. Yeah. And nobody can use fertilizer yes. within five miles. Yes. Nobody threw out a pop can within five miles. It's totally impossible to do it in the United States. Did you discuss dehydrating at all? No, but if you want it, there's, if, if it's comb honey, the only way you can dry it is going to be while it's capped, and that takes longer to do. But the way I did it when I was a smaller beekeeper, and this is, I like the way it's made, I can demonstrate it. I had a stand that was made a little bit wider, it would have fit this way. My stand was made this wide, and would hold two stacks of honey, and then a dehumidifier slid in here so the first box set this high and that blowed that dry air up through it and that would dry it. Uh, I had a buddy, he put down two batins and put four stacks of honey and had a little hole cut and the bottom had dehumidifier in it and a little bitty fan blowing air up through that or you can blow air down through it. Now I put it in a big dairy tank, run dehumidifiers, turn it on 100 degrees, put a little heat on it and stir it three times a day and I can pull them Three or four days, I can pull 2% of moisture out of it. You're talking about uh, extracted from it. Well, that's uh, liquid. I can, yeah, liquid. You can either put it in a tank, yeah. put a cloth over it, and then put heat it to about 100 degrees and put it in the room with a dehumidifier, keep an air conditioner, keep that humidity real low. And if you put that on about 100 degrees, it'll get more moisture off. And, and then, but then stir it, because you can see it kind of skims over on top. You can see where it's dried on top. It'll have a like a... You see it and you just keep stirring it till you get it down where you need it. I've seen honey come off at 21% fully capped. I've seen it come off in Florida, not my honey, but a buddy's 24%. Because wow. it rains every day in, in June and July down there, they can't dry it. And so the myth is, oh, it's capped over, it's, it's, it's fine, that's not true. And that's one of the big issues that I have with uh, some people who don't think they should check moisture. I think it's very important that you check moisture. I pull orange blossom honey in Florida in a dry year and it'd be 15 and a half, 16 percent. My honey this year was running in low 16s and three years ago, four years ago, it's so wet, everything I pulled off was 18.23 to 19.5. It's just, you know, when it rains every day, the bees can't dry it. And when you get a year, let's you know, dearth and drought and low humidity, <laughs> pretty much, I think it's probably almost dry when they put it in the hive. <laughs> well, you know, the nectar wasn't near as runny because it done dried out in, in the bloom. <coughs> Questions? She's over here taking pictures of me now. <laughs> Questions? Questions? Surely I didn't do that good a job. Well, I can tell you the story here. If y'all want, you want me to tell the story I, I told over there a while ago? Back a few years ago, I sold a bunch of honey to the Mennonite or Amish down in Casey County, and they called me up and said, would you take our bees down to Florida with you? Said, you know, it was a really, really bad dry year. And they had no honey in them. They were real weak. And I said, yeah. I said, you know, you pay me the gas to come to get them, put them in with mine, and I'll take them and... Whatever I make on them, I make, and I'll bring them back. Y'all being good to me, I'll help you. So I, I told myself, I, community, I take them as community property. I think it's about eight, 15, 20 hives. And if that guy's hive die, I'll take a frame or two of brood out of other people's hives and make him one back. So everybody, I have 20 hives, and I get back. And I didn't get out of Florida. When I wanted to, is all the smoke was down there from the woods far. So I, had, I was late getting back, missing honey flow. I got the first load back, and I had theirs on there. I knew they needed them. And I told him, I said, I ain't got time to bring these to you. You're going to have to come up here and get them or wait till I get back. I'm sorry, but I got to go get this other load of bees. Well, we can come and get them. We'll get somebody to come up. I said, okay. Well, what do we need to do? I said, well, bring your bottom boards because I had taken them off their bottom boards and I picked them up and put them on my four-way pallets that I use a forklift to load them. I said, bring your bottom boards. Go out there in the sun still up. Pick them up. Put them on your bottom boards. Strap them together. 
And right before it gets dark, when it starts to get dusk and they've almost quit flying, smoke them, put them in the truck. Don't stop the entrance up. It just pisses them off and makes them worse. It's going to be dark. They ain't going to come out going down the road. And I said, when you get home in the morning, when it gets daylight, just as it gets good and light, smoke them, take them off. I said, bees don't crawl. When it's light, when it's dark, they crawl and sting. Okay, we can do that. Well, they call me. I was in Florida. When you get back, can you come bring your bees to us? I said, yeah, but I thought y'all was going to come and get them. Well, we did, but we bad listeners. <laughs> I said, well, what did you do? Well, we decided we'd be better if we would sneak up on them and grab them and not smoke them or anything and just put them on a truck before they knew what happened. Uh-huh. And she said, that if you could bring them to us, I said, well, how many did you get loaded? How many I need to bring? Well, they're all sitting there, but the first one's sitting out there in the gravel. It's not on the pallet. We, we left it sitting there. Can you put that back on, a, on your pallet and you just bring them like that? And I said, yeah. She said, now, if you don't care, look around there. I said, somewhere, my brother's shoe and his flashlight somewhere. Just bring it when you come. <laughs> so that was my experience. Of, I said, we's bad listeners. I never forgot that. That's been 20 years ago. Bring my brother's shoe in the flashlight. And, and then we had a, this guy there at home was a great big guy. Big fingers. And he talked like this all the time. And his wife was real short and she talked like this all the time. And they were in their 80s, good people. I mean, I mean, I thank the world if I've known them all my life, you know. Well, it was, he was always doing something. You hand him a frame with a queen on it, uh oh, he'd drop it every time. Every time. <laughs> And she should have known better. But Amelia was her name. And she says, we come to local beekeepers meeting, and she says, you know what he did to me? Now, Amelia, you don't have to tell everything you know. Just be quiet. <laughs> now I'm going to tell it. I can't get that high-pitched voice. If I could do it like she did it. And, uh, no, Amelia, just, just be quiet over there. Well, I'm telling what he did. He had a swarm of bees that went up in that tree. Well, I didn't mean to do that. And he told me, said he got the ladder, and he told me, he said, hold the ladder for me while I climb up there and get that swarm down. He got up there and he shook that swarm in that box. He dropped it upside down on my head. Because <laughs> she didn't have a veil on. Uh, it, it was comical. I can't tell it like she told it, but I thought I, my stomach was hurting. I was rolling. So that's some of the stories that I could get into to tell you. I've had some experiences. I got in situations that I won't tell. But anyway, one thing I will tell you that you're not migratory beekeepers, but one of the things I, I get up on top of a load of bees, put nets on. Man, I'd sweat. I was in Florida putting nets on. It was a hundred and some odd degrees, right at the sun going down, and man, our water's running off me. I come off and it felt cool down here. And I figured out it was the heat coming off those bees. It's amazing how much heat they put out. Amazing. I bet you it was 20 degrees hotter up on top of that load than it was on the ground. And I wouldn't, you know, I did, it didn't dawn on me till I climbed back down that day and it felt so cool on the ground. I'm like, wow. Now I know why I get so hot up there. How many pallets do you have? Four. Where, where, where? I was about eight feet up off the truck bed. Now back then I was younger. I climb. I would climb up on the front deck, up on the hood, up on the top of the truck, and climb up on the load and put all the nets on, and then throw the straps on. Then a strap would fall off or something. I had to come all the way back down and go all the way back <laughs> up. But I got wise now. I get help. I try to get three or four people and. You know, two, at least two or three people help me where I can don't have to climb up and down. You go to California? And I don't know more. No, I quit. I quit going to California in seventeen. The most I ever did was a two thousand eleven. I went to Wisconsin with two loads of bees, and California with two loads of bees. And I told somebody here earlier today, I said, "Well, I was as far south as almost Okeechobee. I was in five miles of the east coast, forty miles of the west coast, and hundred miles of California or of Canada." And they got picked up and moved. I think I, I counted it up one time. I think it was 52 times that the hive was picked up and moved that year. Because you, you know, when you unload the semi, 
you set them on the ground. Then you got to pick them up, put them on the truck. Then you got to put them on the truck, put them back where they went. Then you come back the other way. You got to put them back on the truck, take them to the hold that yard, set them back on the ground, then set them on the semi. So you're moving, you know, what one, two, three, four, six times just to move them one place and back one place. A lot of moving. You hope they do. Sometimes they don't. Well, I was just pollinating those crops. I did well up there in Wisconsin when I came out of cranberries. I went in honey production, and I had to take the honey off up there. But I got tired of ripping and running, so I just Kentucky, Florida. I'm about ready to quit Florida. We just the oranges are dying, and it's just getting where it's not worth it. Too much running. Fuel's too high. Trucking bills. I don't want to. I used to take a load of semi load, go get them, come back, pick another load up, go. I hire a load now, but they've got so expensive. Everybody thinks you get rich in almonds. It's anywhere from twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars round trip now to take a load of bees to Florida to California. You got to take that right off the top before you do your feed and your pollen sub and all the stuff. You got to get them built up in February to be ready to go wow. the first of February, and you, you, it's just not worth it to me. Not worth the hassle. I've, I've heard it said that the honey that the bees make from almonds is not good. It's not edible. Is that true? Very bitter. That's what I heard. Yeah. Very bitter. The the almond pollen is very nutritious. Some of the best pollen you can get if they don't spray fungicides. But the bit the honey is bitter. It's pretty bad. It's not as bad as um, red bud. Red bud. If I mix castor oil, used oil, and scorched honey together, it would taste a little bit like red bud. They don't usually make much of it. No. I, I just you know you'll have some in the in the brew con when you taste of it you go oh. But I never made enough honey out there that. You know there's some hives sometimes may pick up ten pounds or something in the brew box but come back kind of heavy but. It's not good, not good at all. What do you get for bees? Let the bees take care of it. I let the bees eat that. That's their food. Yeah, about like red bud. I got some red bud honey one time, and uh, I took it. The American Beekeeping Federation was letting people taste it. And that's not very good. <laughs> that's bad, and it, it's the type of honey you put it in there. It's a little bitter. The longer it's in there, the worse it gets. And then they run the water fountain. They cuss me, accuse me of putting stuff in the honey. I know that's pure honey. What kind is it? Well, I don't know, but surely you don't sell any of that. And I know I just look when you taste it, <laughs> but it's bad. It's real bad. Normally, red bud it blooms so early that they use that for their use. But that year we got it, it's one of those years it got warm and stayed real pretty for a week. And the strong hives had put some up in the super that we'd put on to give them room. And I don't know, we got two or three gallons of it, and I had fun with it. Fed the rest of it back to the bees. To the <laughs> Any more questions? Pollen and buildup, yeah. That's very, you say very nutritious? Very nutritious pollen, very nutritious. It's just the problem with, with you know, when I look at almonds, some people never got paid last year. Most people didn't get paid till May, and you got to front all that money. Uh, you get stuck at the border if they find one ant or claim they found one ant, they want you to go get the load washed, and that costs $2,500, which is a, it's a money racket. Uh, and then you're losing at least a week of, brood rearing by the time you get from here to out there and here back that's two weeks of brood rearing and if you get there two weeks before the bloom you lost two more weeks it's cold if it rains the whole time you know and you and if you make a hundred and fifty dollars a high well how much have you really made you, you made what you think you made I'll never go back unless I send a load out there get paid pollination fee and want to sell them sell them to somebody out there and they pay me for them and if I go, they're going to pay me when they go on a truck or I don't send them. This business is sending bees and getting paid in May's for the, you know, I'm not a banker. And you, I know a guy last year sent four loads and he did, it, it, May he ain't got paid. And he said, I only got $50, $60 left. He said, I've already fronted a hundred and something thousand dollars in freight bills. He said, I'm broke. And he said, I haven't got paid. He said, and I need to feed bees and I got work to do. And, you know, and it, it's ridiculous. It's just, and, they, and beekeepers have let them get away with it too long. 
Thank Any you more questions? Great job. Thank, Thank you. you.